Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Fish. We hit 100k. 100,000 people have been successfully fooled into hitting the subscribe button. <laughs> That's crazy. Seriously, thank you so much for watching the videos and just hanging out with me to talk guitar stuff. Never imagined actually getting to this point. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty surreal, to be honest. Legitimately, I don't know what else to say besides thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this and to make guitar content for the internet. But uh, yeah, let's get on with the episode. Quick recap of the upload since last episode in case you missed them. Finally checked out the crown jewel of the Schechter lineup, Keith Marrow's KM7 Mark III Artist. Probably one of the most insanely spec guitars I've ever played. Stainless steel frets, Fishman Fluence, freaking nine piece neck. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And then another video that's been a long time coming, finally found the sack to mess with one of my favorite guitars of all time. New episode of Nostalgia Fish featuring the ESP Standard Eclipse 2. Guitar prices are a little nuts right now, but usually these are some of the best value buys on the market for a seriously premium level instrument. Links to those will be in the cards and the description for you to check out after this video. In the meantime, we've actually got a lot to talk about this week. My editor Jordan's got his work cut out for him. Hit the like button to support the video. Hit subscribe for a chance to win some free gear because we're giving away some really nice stuff. Stay tuned until the end of the video for how you can do that. Let's jump into it. Sal, Fireboard Fanboy says, Bro, please tell me you're gonna check out the Epiphone Alex Lifeson model. It's got the access heel joint. I can't get it because I'm a lefty, so I want to live vicariously through a review. Ah, oh, that is so unlucky. I feel so bad for lefty guitars. But trust me, I've been pushing Harley Benton so hard to offer more models at launch and left-handed. Like, there have been numerous conversations about it. There's been some pushback because obviously left-handed is a much smaller market. If you've got very limited production capacity because say, I don't know, for example, a global health event is happening, mathematically it makes sense to only do right-handed models. But slowly but surely, we are getting there. One more of the models I was a part of designing the EX76 Classic is now available in left-handed. Minor victory, but lefties, I see the comments, we're trying. But I guess we should talk about the guitar you were asking about. So the Alex Lifeson Epiphone Signature Les Paul Standard Access just dropped, and if you only gave it a passing glance, you'd think it's essentially just a Les Paul Standard with a Floyd Rose. And I'm not gonna lie to you, that concept has me somewhat torn. On one hand, this is the single Colt channel. We generally love everything that is even remotely Les Paul shaped. On the other hand, I don't like Floyds enough to overlook how annoying they can be, especially when they're fully floating. So I'm not too sure what my opinion on this model is yet. So let's run through the specifics together and break it down. This new Epiphone is based on Alex Lifeson's custom shop signature he had a few years back. Although this time it's much more attainable for the rest of us. Comes in a single color, Viceroy Brown which I assume is a Rush reference of some sort. If you know, educate me in the comments, please. Of course, it's got the classic Les Paul specs, mahogany body, mahogany neck, Indian Yanni fingerboard. How dated is that reference? <laughs> Indian Laurel fingerboard, which right now is the Rosewood alternative of choice for affordable guitars. To me, it does feel very similar to Rosewood, just generally a little lighter in color. The neck profile is listed as the Lifeson profile, which I'm gonna guess because of the modern nature of the guitar is a slim taper D that may be slightly modified. It's got what looks to be the access neck heel, thank goodness. Epiphone's been obsessed with the modern neck joint recently. It's been on the Les Paul Modern, obviously, and also the Prophecy, the upcoming new Matt Hafey signatures. Personally, it doesn't do anything for me. Like, it still has most of the blockiness of the traditional Les Paul joint but with slightly less mass. I much prefer the feel of the Access. Although I guess it would have been kind of odd to name this the Access and then not have the Access joint. Moving on, it's also got a belly car for comfort. Awesome. Now, while we're looking at the back of the body though, you may have noticed that there's a lot of plastic panelage. That's as good a word as any, I guess, we move. So there's actually a lot going on under the hood. First off, I normally associate GraphTech as being the nut masters but in this case, they've supplied the entire tremolo, complete with their ghost piezo pickup saddles. Piezo, 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 who knows how it's pronounced. The point is, that means that in addition to the standard electric guitar sounds, you can also get natural acoustic sounds out of this guitar. Kind of funny how the ghost tremolo is in this guitar, but they've used a non-ghost tremolo in the ghost horse. I don't know, is that a stupid thought? 
Again, we move. Looked it up on Graphtech's website. That's a $300 piece of hardware at retail. So the fact that it's in an Epiphone Les Paul, that's really cool. There's a Pro Bucket 3 in the bridge. Meh, found it pretty muddy in the Inspired by Gibson Les Paul Custom. But interestingly, they've put a Ceramic Pro in the neck. So it should have pretty hot lead tones from the neck position compared to a standard Les Paul. The control scheme here is that you've got separate volumes for the bridge and neck humbuckers. Each are push-pull to split them individually. You've got a piezo volume, push-pull to activate, and then a master tone. So you can blend the two systems with the mono jack or there's an additional output jack to get the sound separately. Between the splits and the blendable piezo, there is so much you could potentially do with this. Even if you're not a fan of the Epiphone Mudbuckers, that's just an easy part to swap out. Much easier than retrofitting a Floyd Rose into a Hardtail Les Paul, for example. Like, throwing a set of Bare Knuckle Ragnaroks or something, combine that with the piezo, you've got a Les Paul that can cover everything. In general, I love classic looking guitars with a hot rotted vibe. Personally, could do without the floating trim, but overall, it's such a unique feature set for a Les Paul. Yeah, this spec breakdown's been pretty helpful. I've decided that I really like it. I mean, it is a single cut. It had a pretty good chance of getting a thumbs up on this channel from the beginning. <laughs> but what about you? What do you think of the Alex Lifeson Access? And let me know if you want to see a demo on the channel. If there's interest, you can reach out to Epiphone and see if we can make something happen. Hugh G. Rection <laughs> says, not really a guitar or music related question, but how did you become a Liverpool supporter? Also, come on the Reds. I mean, I've always loved the beautiful game. You grow up outside of the US, that's just what you play. I remember in third or fourth grade, our school field was basically a gravel lot. It's a concrete, no nets, a random like metal pipe sticking out of the penalty spot on one side. At least one kid would get really hurt every recess. In the US, that's a lawsuit before you've even kicked the ball. In China, it was like, play on. And I have English cousins. As a kid, I was over there visiting and they said I could support Liverpool or they would beat me up. So between the two options, I chose Liverpool Football Club, up the Reds. Anthony Flores asks, can you do a review on the new Solar T style lineup? Please, they are amazing. I agree, they are amazing. And this isn't the first time the internet has been obsessed with the Swede and T series, although this time they are on the same side. At this point, I've kind of just given up on following every new Solar guitar release. It's impossible. It's one of the things that makes it such an exciting company to follow the progress of. There's always just something new. So when the last Ask a Fish went up about a week ago at the time of filming, Ola had just introduced the new Solar T style. When that video was published, there was only one introductory model to the series. That was like the aged metal barn caster and it looks so cool. Now, as of filming this episode, there's <coughs> seven. And by the time the video goes up, there may be 20. We'll do the best we can, let's go through what's new. So the one series that's the higher level with premium specs, like stainless steel frets, lumen lays, locking tuners. In addition to the metal barn caster I'm a huge fan of, They've also got a flat carbon matte alder body version. 100 bucks less and you still get the Evertune. That's always been one of Solar's strongest aspects. I believe 1099 is the most affordable factory Evertune guitar on the market. Then an open pore Swamp Ash version with a Floyd. I right, still a bit iffy on Les Pauls with a Floyd. Metal T style with a Floyd though. All right, I can get behind that. And the last one series, right now at least, is a seven string with an Evertune. Okay. That is cool. What is it about the T-shape that lends itself so well to extended range? Like seven strings, eight strings, baritones? I don't know, but it just works. I used to have Michael Kelly's seven and eight string tellies, really like those. Only sold them because I got a seven string with an Evertune and extended range without pitch drift it is awesome. It's really difficult to go back. This, it's a seven string T with an Evertune, so hmm, I don't know, that's looking tasty. The more affordable two series, there's a six in matte carbon, one in matte white, mad gym root vibes, and then one in natural matte ash body, mad traditional vibes. A single size dual rail in the neck, it really surprises me that this is not a bolt-on. It's a set through neck, so it's got that awesome upper fret access, but part of what gives Tellys that signature snappiness is the bolt-on neck and in fact the AB series the only other Solars that have that humbucker bridge dual rail neck pickup combo are bolt-ons for that reason. Still cool but yeah caught me off guard that it's not a bolt-on. I mean overall seven models right out the gate none of them have even shipped yet 
that's pretty ballsy. The way global supply chain is right now, at least judging from my experience with Harley Benton, these have probably been in the works for close to a year. It wasn't like they just teased one, gauged the audience reaction, and were like, okay, let's do more. For some reason, that seems to be the impression some people have with the guitar industry. Like, if something's popular, you can just <laughs> out new models whenever. Nah, I wish, but that's really not how it works. This was a calculation they did months ago, way before the shape was public knowledge. They clearly had a lot of confidence in the new T-style, as they should. I think it looks crazy cool. Still, I think the aged metal barn caster is the coolest one of the lot. What do you think? Which do you like the most? And what do you think of this T-shape compared to other metal takes on the style? Love to know what you're thinking. Before we get into the next question, I want to give a huge shout out to Belongs in Arkham and the rest of the amazing patrons that support the channel and make all the honest reviews possible. You guys are awesome. If you want to support the channel as well, Patreon and merch are the best ways. Links to those in the description. It's just if you want to. Again, I'm amazed and appreciative. You guys are just here to talk gear. So, uh, into the next question. Croc says, seeing as you're very much a fan of massive beefcake amplifier heads, what's your opinion on low watt amplifiers? I always was kind of wondering what your thoughts would be, especially seeing as smaller amps are becoming more and more the norm. So I do have videos on lunchbox tube heads, like the Rev G20, which right now is my favorite lunchbox tube head, and the Houston Kettner Grandmeister Deluxe 40. Both really cool amps if you want my full thoughts on those. But the world of tube amps is quite interesting. Logically, that entire market shouldn't exist. Like if you had an algorithm analyze it, it would say that solid state is more consistent, it's more reliable, and yet the market does exist because tubes sound so good. But I think you were right. Small amps were becoming the norm 2018, 2019. But, and this may be because I've been living in a very limited bubble this past year, I think a lot of that has changed. Let me explain. When it comes to small tube amps, a lot of people are buying them because they are literally cheaper. And if that sounds like a dumb point to make, what I mean by that is I don't think, at least when it comes to high gain, people necessarily like the sound of a lunchbox head compared to a big one. It tends to be the opposite. The big ones are chunkier, they're fuller, more wattage means more headroom. In general, it's a richer, more dynamic tone. People who use real calves also tend to like how much physical air they push. It's hard to replicate that with lower wattage amps. But the big amps tend to be more expensive, sometimes by an extreme amount, because they also tend to be the hand-built flagships. Take using Kettner, for example. The import Tubemeister Deluxe 20 is 750. Reasonable. The hand-wired German Triant Mark III is like four grand, and that is a ton of money. It also used to be that big tube heads were completely impractical volume-wise. Like, they are so stupid loud. And tube heads, you do have to run them in a certain volume to get them sounding their best. I don't mean you have to dime them like I hear you have to do with old-school Marshalls, but like the PV, for example, sounds best at around three or four, in my opinion, and that's still deafening through a real 4x12 cab and will get you evicted from any city apartment. The smaller ones are more practical with a real cab from a volume standpoint. But even volume isn't so much an issue now with accessible DI load boxes. Luke swears by the St. Rock React IR. I use the Tunos Torpedo Live. The Tunos Captor X is another cool one. It's cheaper, it's smaller, it acts as a power attenuator as well. You can run your tube heads through those, load in an IR, go straight into your interface. It's like you're recording professionally mic'd 4x12 cabs with V30s completely silently into your computer. Speaking of which, I've been working with Luke to put together an IR pack that is unlike anything else out there, so stay tuned for that. The point I've been slowly trying to get to is that actually, and over the past year especially, when some people haven't been spending as much money going out, from amp companies I've talked to, we've seen a surprise surge in the popularity of the beefcake amps, as you put it. And on the practical side of tone, we've also seen a surge in the popularity of plugins. Neural DSP and STL tones are making some great natural sounding stuff. The Quad Cortex finally launched another player in that modeler profiler space meant that there were some great deals on used campers, used helixes. With so many options, I wouldn't say smaller heads are necessarily becoming the norm. The market, to me, in 2021 seems more balanced than it has been in a while. Lunchbox tube heads still have their unique niche, like if I'm going to a friend's place to jam, or if there's a small gig, I'm bringing the Rev G20 or the Houston Kettner Grandmeister Deluxe. <coughs> Lugging all 60 pounds of a rock of herb around. And the accessibility factor is huge. Full tube tone at a lower price, that's always cool. But for home studio use, nothing beats the chunk of a big ass tube head. So what are your thoughts on amps in 2021? Are you using a big tube head, small tube head, plugins, modeler? Also curious why you're using what you're using. Is it for the tone? Is it for the practicality? 
Let me know what you're thinking. Now, of course, it's time to hear from yet another adoring fan. It's the high praise of the week. <laughs> Your face is dumb. That's so stupid. I got nothing. You got me. On to more positive things. Music recommendation for the week is Bitter by Chunk. No Captain Chunk. Easy core at its finest. It's going to be a better record than the last A Day to Remember album. I'm calling it now. All right, so the moment you've been waiting for, it's giveaway time. So at 100K, I had kind of planned on doing a huge giveaway involving all of the channel favorite brands. Like... All of them. I'll be honest, that was really ambitious and I didn't have time to organize everything. Instead, we're gonna do somewhat weekly giveaways. How does that sound? I think given the usual interpretive upload schedule, that's more on brand for this channel anyways. So WTF, Rev Amplification's winter testing facility, just so happened to coincide with 100K. One of my favorite brands for tone generation, I use the Generator Mark III all the time. So I'm stoked to be able to get some Rev stuff straight from Canada into your guys' hands. So what do I have for you guys? Three prizes. First up, a personalized hockey jersey with your name and your number. I don't know <coughs> about hockey, but this is pretty comfortable. And it's very on brand for a Canadian ass company. Next, a set of Rev's celebrated G series pedals. So that's the G2, the G3, and the G4 voiced after the green, the purple, and the red channels of Rev's flagship generator amps, respectively. It covers everything from light crunch to bone-shattering metal, but for this giveaway, it's not the normal versions. Ah, no. These are special, limited edition, Canadian-ass versions. And lastly, up for grabs is the Alpha Series amp of your choice. So that's either the D20, the super clean pedal platform, or the aforementioned G20, the mini fire breather. Full tube amps, made in Canada with two notes integration, built-in customizable cab sim with direct out via XLR. These are so, so cool, man. They sound great. And the fact that you can just use this and get a consistent, professionally mic sound directly into your interface, amazing. So that's what I have to give away. How can you win? Let's get you guys in a creative mood. First, you gotta be subscribed to this channel obviously. Then head over to Instagram, make sure you're following me and Rev over there. And I want you to post a short 15-30 second Canada-themed cover. Nickelback guitar cover, Justin Bieber sing-along, harmonica solo over a National Geographic Moose documentary. Doesn't matter. It's not a talent competition. Skill and creativity have equal weight. I just want to see what you guys come up with. Post it with the hashtag RevkaFish 100k so we can see it. Winners will be announced next Ask Fish episode which will hopefully be next week. Might be a little later. I'm taking a week-long break, so don't get burnt out. I've got a couple of videos scheduled, but I won't be making any new content for a couple days. So you have a week-ish to enter. So get on it. Huge shout out to Rev for making all this available. They make awesome stuff and they're great. They're always down to do fun stuff with the YouTube community. They're also giving you a chance to win one of their big boy amps, a Canada Edition Generator 100R. Link to that giveaway in the description as well, because if you've got a chance to win a free one of those, you kind of want to do it. So that'll do it for this episode of Ask Fish. I think I've talked your faces off enough. Get your giveaway entries in. Social media, merch, and Discord server links are in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome, and I'll see you in a couple weeks. Take care of yourselves.